Bill. Um, Bill is a Chief Strategy Officer at IAX and Executive Director of DrPeering.net, which is a blog on, um, on peering. And he's the author of the Internet Peering Playbook, Concepts to the Core of the Internet, and is an internationally recognized expert on Internet peering and Internet exchange points. Um, and that book is pretty much like the only book on Internet, ex uh, internet peering, so um, this is the guy that wrote it. <laughs> uh, from 98 to 2008, uh, Mr. Norton held a position as the co-founder and chief technical liaison to uh, Equinix. Um, Mr. Norton led several NANOC uh, peering bird of the feather sessions, which came to be popular fixtures of the, of the NANOC meeting. Um, Mr. Norton's uh, business case for peering is now used by virtually every company that uh, engages in large-scale traffic engineering. From 87 to 98, uh, Mr. Norton was the uh, Internet en Engineering ma um, Manager responsible for, among other things, chairing NANOG, the Operations Forum, Forum of North America Internet from 95 through 98. He received his MBA from uh, Michigan Business School and his Computer Science uh, degree from uh, a post on college. Uh, he's coming all the way from San Francisco, so uh, please give him a big welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, do we have any time left after that introduction? <laughs> uh, I'm going to not take away your time. <laughs> so um, I, I spent 11 years across the other side of Lake Michigan working at Ann Arbor, uh, the University of Michigan there. And uh, at Merit Network, one of the projects I was working on was the NSFNet project. Uh, Merit Network, co-located at the University of Michigan, was running that. And um, it, it was really interesting back in the day because um, as the internet became more and more popular, uh, other networks wanted to connect to the internet. One specifically was a, a network called Sprintlink which had an X400 mail service that initially was just wholly contained, but they wanted to have a gateway into the NSF net. And that was one of the projects that we Merit ran. Uh, one of the, the things that happened is occasionally you'd get a, um, uh, an angry caller from, from Sprint saying that the mail was having problems and the, the internet was broken and as one woman demanded, I need to talk to the owner of the internet. <laughs> and being the young engineer that I was, I said, well, that would be me. <laughs> and the rest of it turned into kind of a Crank Yankers episode. <laughs> but I started noticing uh, during those days, um, uh, during the early days of, of, of Nanog, that all of my friends were becoming millionaires and multimillionaires, and the internet was becoming very popular. And here I was working at the University of Michigan, not making a whole lot of money. And as I was lamenting that, I decided, because sometimes I do this, one way to relieve stress is I'll, I'll clean the rugs. I'll shampoo the rugs in my house. So in the, in the summer, I got the steam cleaner out. I moved all the furniture into the kitchen. And the stuff I couldn't fit into the kitchen, I would put on the side driveway. And the stuff I couldn't fit on the side driveway, I would move out the front and have on the front lawn. So I'm steam cleaning the, the rug in, in my house, and there's a guy sitting on the couch in front of my house. And I say, excuse me, can I help you? And he says, sorry, it looks like all the good stuff's gone already. <laughs> so he obviously thought it was a garage. Anyway, so I had all this junk. I wasn't making any money, and I finished my MBA at the Michigan Business School. Um, and the good thing was chairing Nano gave me the visibility that I got recruited by Jay Adelson and Al Avery to go launch a, a company called Equinix, eventually we called Equinix. That was a very large global data center. The problem is, while I ran the, the internet engineering group that deployed the first route servers across the network access points, I didn't really fully understand the nuances of peering and the, the nature of the different peers between themselves. And here I was, I sold my house in Michigan, I had to give away my dog, that was actually harder and move out to California, but I, I, I needed to understand what this peering stuff was myself. So the way that I, I did that was, I, um, well, I, I guess the way, the way to explain it was, um, if you guys read this book, Blink, by Malcolm Gladwell, one of the points he makes is that our human brain is only good at detecting patterns after about 50 exposures. 
and then we can consciously draw the, the lines between the, the points. 80 uh, exposures and you tend to have about 80 or 90 percent confidence that you're seeing a pattern. Um, so in other words, if you are going fishing, you would need to go about 50 fishing trips and get some experience to develop the pattern to notice that the fish really seem to like this particular area of the lake. And I bring this up because when I was a kid, we went up to Jenny Lake, which is up in the Adirondacks. I was born and raised in upstate New York, and this was the, uh, the actual lake where um, we, we spent our summers. And I, I did have a lot of exposures on fishing trips, mostly lake fishing, a lot of largemouth basses. And what you see uh, over here is Sandy Rock, and over here is, I'm sorry, uh, Sandy Cove and um, uh, um, uh, Table uh, Top Rock. And we found there's an area right over here where there's some logs, uh, some trees that had fallen into the shallows, and you'd see a fair amount of fish there. We caught a lot of fish over there. But it took about 50 or so trips before we would actually find that out empirically. Now my uncle Richard was a scuba diver. So what he did is he came out with his scuba gear and he swam around the lake and he actually swam with the fishes. He found out where the fishes were, what type of fishes were in which locations, where the big schools were. And that was really how I learned about peering. I decided that I was going to go swim with the fishes. So I designed my job at Equinix as co-founder and chief technical liaison to mean that I would be 90% externally focused. I went to all of the internet operations conferences that I could and I would ask people at those conferences over beers or lunches or dinners, What's, uh, what is this peering thing? How do you define peering? And I'd, I'd get their answer and I would document that in the form of a of a piece of paper and I'd then over the next lunch or dinner I'd say this is what the previous guys were saying is peering. Is that your definition and what's the process you go through to identify who you want to peer with and where you want to peer. And, and I would document what I would learn in the field and after about a, a hundred walkthroughs and iterations I would have in my hand a white paper that represented the community mindset on a previously undocumented practice, internet peering. And uh, because I collected it from the field, I wanted to propagate it out back to the field, so I would make it uh, freely available. I'd email it out to anybody, and I, I found I was invited to speak at, at more conferences. And um, this was the, the first white paper I wrote called Interconnection Strategies for ISPs that talked about when does it make sense to build into an exchange point. And when I sent that out to anyone and everyone that wanted it, I found myself invited to speak at other conferences. And then I could make the pitch about the next white paper I wanted to write. So during my 10 years at Equinix, I authored about 12 white papers on various topics about what is peering, what's the practice of peering, um, what is, what's the impact of video on peering. Does that make you more desirable or less desirable? Those types of topics. When I retired in 2008, I sold all my stock options, uh, cashed out, but I found that a lot of the researchers liked the white papers, but they were more difficult to cite at the time than if it was in the form of a book. So I spent nine months in retirement rewriting all the white papers into this book. Um, rewritten, updated, I added some more chapters. Um, so. This really is the community mindset on peering. It's not theoretical. It's not an abstraction. This is ground truth based upon what I've learned in the field. So uh, at least a few of you guys will be walking away with this, this book tonight. Um, but the rest of the night I, I thought what I would do is share with you some of the insights um, that are in this book that you might find interesting, maybe a little bit um, intriguing. Really the, the name of this talk tonight is why peer? What is the motivation for people to peer? And what I learned is that there are actually a handful of these today. The first one that came up was that peering can save you money. Specifically, you have a transit meter that spins fairly fast as you send more and more traffic. And if you can identify 
people that are willing to peer with you, that will reduce the speed at which that transit meter spins. And the way I captured that in the field is with this graph here. Uh, this is the number of megabits per second of traffic exchange, and this is the dollars per megabit per second. So if we assume a price point of, <clears throat> let's say about $5 per meg, it's probably less. Some people paying more, actually in rural Texas, I showed this graph that showed the price of transit constantly declining over the years down to a, a dollar or to a meg, and a guy from rural Texas comes to me and says, Bill, we're paying about $75 a meg in rural Texas. <coughs> and I said, why is that? He said, AT&T is the only provider, and there's no competition, so the, the price ends up being uh, r relatively high there. Uh, so what's the alternative to that? The alternative is you build out a, some peering infrastructure and then you allocate the cost of that peering infrastructure across the number of megabits per second you can peer directly. And if you can peer enough megabits per second for free across an infrastructure that costs you a fixed price, you get to this point that's called the peering break-even point. That's where the cost of transit exactly equals the cost of peering. And that's where you can financially prove, not convince, but prove that peering will actually save you money. And then as you peer more and more traffic away for free, the cost of peering is lower and lower and lower and lower and you're saving a lot of money potentially here. Back when we did this analysis with the cable companies that all built into Equinix, they were saving tens of millions of dollars a piece by not having to send that traffic through the upstream ISPs. So just to punch in some numbers, round numbers in here to demonstrate this, let's assume that the price of transit was $5 a meg, and let's assume that the cost of peering is $2,500. That is, it costs you $2,500 to build into an exchange point, plop a router down, have a little colo, and then connect to the peering fabric. Now, if, if that was the case, if you peered one megabit per second, and it cost you $2,500 to do so, how much is that per megabit per second? $2,500 per megabit per second, that's pretty pricey. But if you do 100 megabits per second, the price per meg comes down to what, about 25 bucks a meg, right? If you do $500, if you do 500 megabits per second, and it costs you $2,500 to do so, then you're uh, exactly equal to $5 per meg of transit, and you should be indifferent between just buying transit or peering some of that traffic away for free. And then if you can peer more than 500 megs of traffic, then you start getting into the gravy section and it starts looking really good. So, uh, so what is this cost of peering that we're talking about? Well, uh, here we have a three deployments where you have a router. If you're ISP A, you have a router and you buy a circuit into an exchange point. You need to buy a router. You have to get a port onto that uh, exchange point fabric, and you need to rent colo. If you add those numbers together, that ultimately is the, the cost of peering. Um, so you have the router capex, you've got the co-location fees, you've got the port fees, installation fees, that kind of stuff. There is a, a new technique, though, that I want to share with you tonight. It's very popular in Europe. They call it remote peering in Europe. In, in the U.S., we're calling it tethering. And the alternative here is instead of deploying routers at each one of these exchange points in a remote place, instead of buying routers, instead of leasing co-location space, instead of buying a fixed circuit to each one of these locations, instead what you use is a remote peering provider. Uh, they will deliver you a pipe that will give you VLAN access into these exchange points. Again, this is a very popular thing in Europe, not quite as popular yet in the U.S. And what this does is it removes the cost of the router from the peering equation. Remember the cost of peering being 2500 bucks? Well, you don't have to buy a router anymore. You don't have to lease the co-location space. So that means that the cost of peering drops down, and that makes it a whole lot more affordable when doing the peering versus transit analysis. So if you, if you take a look at the service delivery model, it looks kind of like this. What you buy from the remote peering provider is a, uh, let's say, a 10 gig port. And what you deliver it are individual VLANs, one for each of the exchange points that you want to connect to. Does that make sense? And what that ultimately does to the financial math of peering is where traditional peering 
starts out way up there and you keep on reducing the cost of peering by the number of megabits per second you peer away for free, now you start at a lower place because you don't have a collocation cost. You don't have a monthly cost of e e uh, amortized equipment. You don't have the fixed cost of, of transport. So you start way down here, which means the peering break even point is a whole lot lower. Just to plug in some additional numbers, uh, LinkedIn was kind enough uh, in this research to share some actual deployment cost figures. They did this in Europe. They deployed into four locations across Europe. And instead of having to uh, spend $275,000 per pop with a remote peering solution, that went to zero. Likewise with the OPEX, that's the, uh, the co-location expense, they got rid of that. And the cost that they paid for remote peering in Europe was $6,000, which interestingly enough is about the same cost that they paid to their remote peering provider. So if you can get access to all those routes without having to buy the, the routers, why wouldn't you do that? So uh, the point is, tethering opens up peering to a much broader set of peering participants potentially. Now the smaller co-locate, I'm sorry, the uh, smaller content providers that previously couldn't afford to peer can get into it. Enterprises can afford to get into peering even if they don't have a lot of megabits per second to peer away for free. To me this is very interesting because it means that the landscape of peering, it could be about to change. The other question that comes up is, okay, so now you have two models for peering. You have a, a physical deployment model, that's what I call a traditional peering, and now you have this new thing called tethering or remote peering. When do each of those make sense? And from working with the people in the field, I've come to the conclusion that it's actually a blend. The question is, what is the optimal blend for your traffic type? If you're a CDN, having a physical deployment makes a whole lot of sense because you want to cache those objects as close to the eyeballs as possible. That's part of your value proposition. If you're a remote peer, you're going to have the latency involved with getting those objects to the edge, so it's suboptimal. So you'll probably be weighted more towards the internet peering side along with some, some transit. But I think a lot of the enterprises, a lot of the smaller content guys, will start leaning more heavily on this new technology because it's going to be more cost effective and they can in fact enter into the peering ecosystem and have it financially make sense. Does that make sense? So this is all pretty new stuff. Like I said, in Europe it's been going on for about five or six years, but it's just starting to um, uh, be put in place uh, in the U.S. now. So why peer? One of the reasons is to save money. Another reason is to improve performance. And I gotta tell you, for the last 15 years I've been looking for data to prove that peering improves performance. And it's only been this last year where I actually found the data points. Both LinkedIn and um, uh, Priceline.com have contributed data that demonstrates clearly the performance improvement that peering provides. This is before peering on that side, this is after peering. Before peering, after peering. So you can see the download time decreases. He also had about a dozen other graphs that showed that the stability of peering actually was better than the stability of going through the transit route, which I guess intuitively makes some sense. So that was two. Third reason why peering, peering makes money. Can you guess how? How would peering make an ISP more money? Because your customer is still paying you five bucks a meg and if it costs you zero to deliver it, then you make more money. Uh, that's a good answer. Another answer is what Dave Rand told me. Dave Rand came up with this. He was the CTO at AboveNet. And he said, if you look at the service of transit, you're a, as an ISP, you want that transit meter to spin as fast as possible. Peering gives you a low latency path oh, sure. to the peer, which means the TCP IP window opens up faster. Further, if you and I are directly peered, there's less chance of packet loss. Mm -hmm. So when packet loss occurs along a transit path, the TCP IP window divides by two, the meter spins slower, you make less money. He said you're financially incented as an ISP to peer as broadly as you can to get low latency and low packet loss interconnects and then you'll make more money. 
What do you think? Attract more traffic from multi home customers? Uh, what do you attract? Uh, I'm trying to remember how I, how I, my customers delivering 10 gigs of traffic or whatever, how, how am I making more money by here? Because the, the window is going to open up faster. He'll have more data in the air uh, because the window is open, opening up faster and you, you have less divided by twos. Okay. Uh, you're raising an interesting point, though. If you're multi-home, it's too bad BGP won't prefer a... Uh, well, actually, no, it will. Yeah, BGP will prefer a closer adjacency, a direct adjacency over a more circuitous path. Does that not assume more data? It's like the customer still has the same amount. The customer still has the same amount of they data? They want to pull back the FTP file, right, let's say. It's still a 100 meg FTP file. It's not, it's not 200 meg FTP, FTP files. So it's still got the same amount of data. You're looking at bits per second, though. Data use yeah. will always expand to uh, oh. consume all the available You're data. You're just trying to fill the pipe as fast as possible. Yeah. 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 It's also the case that um, with um, the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, um, but I believe that peer-to-peer -peer actually can detect a lower latency, better performing path and tend to prefer that. Are you saying their, their rate of transfer increases so that their 95% count goes up? But then, yeah, that's, what that's what you said. Okay, now I get it. Uh, is it the 95th percentile is going up, or, or that's, that's how you but I, I think there's, there's when the transfer is done, they can then transfer some more. It, it's yeah. it's it's faster. Yeah. Will they actually do more? The first job quicker. Yes. They're more likely to do another job after. More opportunity to, move move to, to, okay. to your point. If all I'm going to do is get one file, that file is done, I go yeah. home. But that's not human nature. But if the service works better, they get more customers, <coughs> you get more traffic. Yeah. And happier customers, and they stay with you, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. No one else brought that point up when I asked. And then the next one to talk about is how peering improves security. Well, actually, I want to scratch that for a second. I, I want to instead take a, a little diversion and talk about how peering improves mental health. <laughs> <laughs> because as it turns out, a lot of these peering forums, like the one that we just attended in Croatia, are being held at some very nice resorts. <laughs> But seriously though, um, the, the last thing I want to share with you is that I, I did some research with the peering community with all these DDoS attack news items you see. The question was, does peering impact security in any way, pro or con? And what I've learned is that peering actually improves security. And there's three tenets to this argument, and I would like it because this is a brand new white paper. <coughs> so I'd like you to put your critical hat on and allow me to present the proof to you, and you come back to me and tell me how I'm wrong. And I'll share with you also, as I did in the white paper, the strongest counter arguments to the arguments that I'll present to you. Okay? Are you game? Okay. So the logic goes like this. The fundamental nature of internet transit is that traffic gets intermingled. So if you look at any point in the internet to any other point in the internet, the RIPE NCC has done studies and they say that on average there's 4.3 ASs between any point on the internet and any other point on the internet on average. 4.3 ASs. And at each one of these points, Traffic gets intermingled. So traffic from A to G, uh, the first hop, it gets intermingled with B's traffic that might be destined to C or D. And then traffic further gets intermingled. So all this traffic gets intermingled, providing what we call uh, aggregation efficiency. The peaks in one flow of traffic can be offset by the valleys in another set of traffic. So you can actually squeeze a whole lot more traffic on this shared infrastructure as traffic gets blended and merged together. The, the aggregation efficiency can be as much as 2.5 to 1. So it actually is very, very efficient. And everything tends to work out uh, fairly well. Until a DDoS attack happens. In this example, the DDoS attack is uh, going after maybe it's a gambling site and it's being distributed across this infrastructure. A lot of it's going through D, a lot of it's going through E, some's going through F, and then traversing through E. The point is, the traffic from A to G 
is affected by that DDoS attack because all that traffic is merged together, all that traffic is treated equally, so you're likely to get queuing delays, larger latency, you're likely to get packet drops because they're going to be dropping packets left and right. So ultimately, what happens is an attack against X has a side effect of being a denial of service attack against the traffic between A and G. They cannot establish a secure channel between A and G if that traffic has congested those intermediate links. The other thing that's interesting is if you look at the scale of these attacks, it used to be 1 gig and then 10 gig attacks. We call them pea shooters versus bazookas. But when you get to the attacks that we're seeing now on the order of 400 gigabits per second, uh, the last one I heard from Cloudflare was 400 gigabit per second attack that persisted against a target for three days. I mean, again, I, I'm kind of an old school guy. I remember getting my first 14.4 modem, the 19.2s, um, you know. So to me, 100 gig is just a massive, massive amount of traffic. But we're talking about such an enormous scale that the infrastructure ultimately has a hard time handling it. And it's not just DDoS either. It could be spot events. One of the most famous spot events when I was working on the NSFNet project was the, uh, the Oprah Winfrey show when they uh, brought on and webcast an interview with a uh, writer named Eckhart Tolle. Uh, they did it over the web and that just brought down Limelight's network to its knees. And part of the problem was when people didn't get the thing on their screen, they would hit the reload button and that would restart the TCP sessions. And they had to actually get on, Oprah had to get on TV and say, uh, please stop hitting the refresh button on your, I mean, it's kind of an amazing thing. But the point is, it, it may not just be DDoSs. It's a fundamental nature of the intermingling of transit traffic that these types of uh, things happen. But if you take a look at what peering does for you, peering traffic between A and G effectively segregates that subset of traffic to bypass the commodity internet the wild, wild west where that type of stuff is going on. This traffic at least can be immune to the side effects of the attacks that happen across the transit path. And internet exchange will intermingle traffic as well. Multi-points. If you're peering through a fabric and not directly, um, potentially the, the peering fabric could be carrying the same feed upstream. Aren't these switches themselves? Um, what, what's the the, the phrase? They, uh, the 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 fabric itself is not uh, oversubscribed, right? Non-blocking. Non -blocking, oh, thank non -blocking. you. Right, but it, I yeah, if the other ISP, you know, if all the IP, oh, I see what you're saying. What about yeah. the tethering example where that might come back into play? Yeah, the tethering might not have looked at directly if other traffic is already shared through the fabric instead. But you're right, if, if the fabric isn't always subscribed. The fabric isn't, whoever made the tethering comment, I, I think that's right. If the, if the tethering, if the remote peering fabric itself that gets you in there is oversubscribed, then there, there could be a potential there as well. But I, I still look at this and I say, well, there's 4.3 ASs in between point A and G. I, I kind of think that maybe that tethering, that remote uh, peering provider might be managing that, that single, it's not even an AS, it's really a layer two fabric. Uh, but I, I wonder, your point might have some validity to it. Yeah, because like um, Cloudflare at the M6 got hit by an attack and their M6 ports got completely full. Well, when that happened, that was because somebody was needing the uh, hearing the actual pairing IPs that no one's ever supposed to do. Remember? No. Well, I, I realize it happened, ah. but <laughs> no one's supposed to ever, and no one's supposed to accept it either. Yeah. So it was a weird case. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming proper configuration, and that will keep this traffic just between A and G. What happened is that the DOS bought up going through the, the, the IXP. Yeah, but if, if, the, they, the, the route. if it's an IP address behind oh. the port that is sure. being announced, and still all the traffic goes to the IXP board sure. and still filling it up. Also true. Interesting. 
So it was, that's, that's the first argument, that traffic is intermingled, peering traffic bypasses the wild, wild west. The, the, the second argument um, came from the security guys, and they would point out that the commodity internet path up here has more points um, of vulnerability. They, the security guys call this a larger attack surface. There are more network elements between A and G. Specifically, one can tap this fiber, this path between these two networks, mirror it, capture it, redirect it somewhere, um, and then if you look inside of any of those ASs, what's the AS composed of? But routers that can be compromised, taken over, there's underground economy of selling access, and then the links in between those routers themselves likewise can be mirrored, captured, replicated, or what have you. Yeah? From the availability perspective, you would think of it as uh, a lot of single points of failure. As a security engineer, I would think of it as also many single points of failure because if you, you can intercept the traffic at any given place, yeah. that's, that's a, a big problem. So as a security guy, would, would you agree with this argument? Absolutely. So then peering ends up being uh, uh, beneficial because you have fewer network elements between A and G. Fewer single points of failure, I would say. Any co counter arguments to this one? I'd actually have another point that you could also protect slightly against route leaks. If you're, pe if you're peering with G, ah. you're probably preferring that route versus your transit route for G, right? So if somebody, Absolutely. So if somebody, even, even just accidentally, does a route leak, you're, at least to get the G, that's a really good one. You're still going to go the right way. I need to put that one in the paper. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Are we, are you inferring here that your internet exchange point is only peering A and G together, or would per se site F or E be able to come back around through your new shortest path and leverage that peer? Oh, it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be peering. Uh, peering is just between two bilateral uh, peers. It, it would be transit if it went through them. If yeah, if F was sending traffic, yeah, that'd be a different thing. Right. <laughs> That's funny. G should not be announcing your routes to F in this case. You're G, and G does not re-announce your routes. Right. If they did, they they made a mistake, or they're trying to hurt. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> or, they're, or they're happy to reduce your transit bill at their own expense. Yeah. Now, from a cost point, what, how can you leverage that new circuit then to say, G goes and says to F, hey, I have a better way to A, a couple bucks my way, and I'll let you through. Uh, Perry doesn't work that way. If they want to do a separate relationship, he could buy uh, transit. I mean, I, I put these T's and, and P's up there for a reason. Uh, to show the, the the relationships between these guys, F is actually the upstream provider for uh, for G. So F is going to know how to get access to to the rest of the internet, but G is going to prefer the path along this way. So this is really the benefit for A and G. I'll tell you the strongest condo argument that I heard for this one. It's similar. Who said the uh, remote peering one on the last one? Similar counter argument here. What they said is, well, you know, Bill, this you're drawing this as a straight line here. In reality, underneath the covers, there could be a fair amount of network infrastructure between these two points. There could be a fair amount of infrastructure between here, particularly if it's a, a tethered service. There could be a lot of stuff in between those points. I counter that counter argument by saying, well, the same is true for this link and that link and that link and that link. And you could get lucky, and that could be dark fiber, and then it doesn't matter. It would, that would be great, yeah. I think it's, it's a, um, uh, a percentage potential reduction because, for example, if um, B, C, and G are members of the botnet that are going to DOS you, it doesn't matter if you're peering directly with G. Oh. If G has botnets, oh. you're going to get hit yeah. from B, C, and G. So uh, potential. Uh, Percentage of reduction. I'm really glad you brought that one up because I have a counter to that counter argument. Yep. The counter is, um, so uh, what if G is a source of attack against A? What if there's a DDoS from G to A? For me to make the claim that peering improves security, I just have to argue that it doesn't make it worse and it can possibly make it better. 
And the reason it makes it better is actually this last point, which is an empirical observation that came from the peering coordinator for GoDaddy. He said, Bill, when I set up a peering session with you, I get on the phone with you as we're configuring our routers and we're testing to see if the traffic is going through. We're making sure that the routing announcements are working properly. I know your voice. I know your name. We've exchanged escalation pa uh, paths. We know our NOC phone numbers. The NOC should be aware that we have a pairing relationship. So when things go bump in the night, if there's a denial of service attack from one of my customers against one of your customers, I can call you up. Or you can call me up and we can have that dialogue so the time to repair is actually faster as compared with what happens if A contacts D. The knock won't take your phone call because you're not a customer. You don't have any visibility. With A and G, you know the traffic you send between each other. You're going to see the traffic he sends to you and he's going to see the traffic sent to, to back and forth. And you can be on the phone and talk about what you're seeing. So there's more debugging information and empirically it tends to speed up the time of recovery during these types of attacks, during these types of outages. So that's it. Three arguments. It's a Three tenets that lead to the conclusion that peering improves security. What do you think? So that, that, that assumes that the ISP is actually doing their due diligence and securing things properly, right? Well, is it the IXPs or is it the two, the two ISPs? Well, I guess Both. it depends, right? If the IXP is doing a flat layer 2 VLAN and everyone's on the same layer 2 domain, it's simple enough that another peer on that fabric is spoofing them back. Essentially, take it down, right? That has happened in the past. So, IXPs do MAC locking for port. So well, again, well, sorry, we're, we're, we're doing the due diligence on the IXP. I think you have to wait for it. So, you won't get an, uh, an uh, IXP stable if you don't. Yeah. How many organizations pull out of peering because of problems? Because I'm not aware of many, if any. No, uh, me neither. Peering tends to be fairly stable and fairly long-lived. It tends to be. Now, I'll tell you the strongest counter-argument against number three. The strongest counter-argument is, well, Bill, if we peer with a route server, then we don't have the contact information necessarily. We don't have the personal relationship with the other peer. We're peering indiscriminately whatever routes happen to show up on the route server when they happen to show up. So they would say that the number three goes away if you're the type of ISP that appears with the route server. Well, um, at least the ISP I work for, um, you would have the possibility to see where the traffic comes from. So and you can configure the route server, you right? You can um, say, like, oh, don't want to have the routes from this particular participant on the route server. <coughs> and stop at least that announcement. So the counter argument to that one that comes back is the people that tend to peer with the route server tend to be the folks who are peering with a lot of different networks and they don't tend to be as discriminating. They, to put it in, in another way, they don't tend to be as, as clueful because they're operating a small network. They have a small network engineering team. They just, you know. Well, what I see with route servers is that um, for example, a lot of Russian parties in our case use the route server because mm -hmm. they just don't have the ca capacity to communicate properly with, uh, with other, um, other peers. So they have to only switch the route server on and that's it. Yeah. So the question, let's take us to the extreme, right? So let's say everybody could appeal with everybody. Yeah. It's a point where that's no longer useful. And Sell your actually, you gain stock. some power. <laughs> <laughs> you can sell your AT&T stock. And <laughs> it, it, it doesn't tend to happen. You, what you tend to see in the um, in the tier two community, you tend to see a sparse mesh. In the tier one community, you tend to see a, a full mesh. All the tier ones appear in a full mesh with one another in all the interconnection regions. But the tier two guys, they tend to be kind of a blend of open and selective and. Uh, so it tends to be a little bit more of a sparse mesh. Okay. Yeah. Since your argument with peering um, improves performance, if you had in your example G um, attacking A in a peering relationship, 
versus going across the transit connection. Yeah. Uh, and a DDoS attack, would there be any difference that I can get basically more a higher performance DDoS attack on carrying exchange versus a DDoS <laughs> I know my delay is smaller, yeah. get more yeah. right, sinks and all that stuff across there than across the transit? Uh, two things came up when we talked about that in the community. The first was if G is attacking A or A is attacking G, the two parties have a direct relationship. They can work together to try and figure out what's going on. And you always have the backup of cutting that pairing link. In which case, that same denial of service traffic will then go through the, the transit path and you have to pay for it now. <laughs> Well, the G G is not deliberately dosing A in that case. It's one of G's customers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's G's customers. Yeah. So that might get G's attention in a way. Um, the modern DDoS mitigation is mostly involving BGP redirection to the scrubbing center, and I don't see why peering necessarily has to break that ever. You you could do peering that would break that, but you should. So uh, one last point, and then I think my time is done. The other counter argument to number three was, uh, well, Bill, I might be the peering coordinator for Comcast today, but if I get fired tomorrow, all these people I have a personal relationship with may not know that. <laughs> so there's no real strong authentication or strong tie there. I think that's kind of an edge case, though, because if you're a peering coordinator and you pull some shenanigan. This is a pretty small community. <laughs> we, we know each other and your name's going to be pretty bad. You may not have a career after you do something like that. And there are ISPs that have had network engineers that have uh, been disgruntled and they've gone across the network and changed all the passwords on the, all the routers. And go to jail. They, they went to jail? I, I know of at least one case. Is this the one in San Francisco or San Jose? I was thinking of right away. Yeah. Oh, my time is done. Thank you guys very much. Oh, we, we do have some books. Who gave me some good suggestions? You did? Oh, come on afterwards. If, if you made some good points, I'll, I'll give you...